Welcome back to the Open Mic Broadcast Network, the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince, and I have with me for the first time, I believe, in 2024, if I'm not mistaken, Coach Northern. Coach, how you doing, and Happy New Year, sir. Oh, everything going pretty good. Uh, I like think enjoyed the college football playoff game the other day. Now I'm getting ready for some some NFL uh, matchups this weekend, and uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Actually, Adam is going to a uh, – a showcase at Southern this weekend, and he has a tryouts for his high school team. So it's it's one of those deals over there. They have so many kids that try out for baseball that uh, you have to try out every year until you make varsity. And then once you make varsity, it's uh you know you don't have to try out again. So hopefully he'll be uh, lucky enough to make the varsity team this year. Okay, well we're gonna wish him well on that, man. I know. Um, you know, football gets supreme in Texas, but in particular in Cypress, Brenham and Tomball baseball is very, very high on the wish list. So we wish them well on that. Yeah. And uh, I got to tip my hat to you on your Michigan pick, even though I knew Michigan were the big boys on the block. I was mm-hmm. just kind of pulling for the underdog. Washington gave my battle for a little while, but – Nonetheless, um, the right thing happened, depending on how you feel about it with Harbaugh and everything else. But with all that, man, has opened up a whole bunch of what's next. We've had three legendary coaches, uh, two from the professional ranks, one from the collegiate ranks, uh, to no longer be in the big boys' chair. I mean, what, what are you making of all this? And still, we still have what we have at Texas Southern. Yeah, that's, it's one of those things where – and the the crazy thing about it, you know, Coach Saban and Coach Belichick are the best of friends. So I'm pretty sure they probably talked about, you know, sort of some of the things that they're going through, how are they feeling, even though I think if Coach Belichick would have had a, a better year, he probably would still be there. But I think he sort of sees the writing on the wall, and it seems like a mutual parting of the ways between him and uh, Mr. Kraft, or that own, owner of the uh, Patriots. Coach Saban, I think he he just sort of, you know, sometimes when things change in sports and something you've been doing for a long time and you like doing it a certain way, I, I think that sort of wore on him a little bit with the with all the NIL and the transfer portal, even though he, he took advantage of both. Um, you know, after a while, it can be a little bit overbearing having to re-recoup your own team and trying to see who's out there that can make or break your roster for next year. That can be a little bit of a burden. You know, it used to be where football coaches, just say if you break down the year, you know, January was a lot of recruiting. You were on the road recruiting. Then February, you came back, you did your morning workouts, and a little bit of advanced recruiting, you might set up your junior day. Then March and April was spring football. Late April was uh, spring recruiting. You're going to look at all the guys that's about to be juniors and seniors. So now that time frame has totally flipped because they allowed you to work with your own players where it used to be nothing but the strength coach can work with the guys. So now, you know, the, the coaches usually get a break after recruiting, uh, after spring ball, before they go on the road. So now – with all the things that are going on, coaches don't get that what we used to call family time that they were getting with their families, you know, being able to go on the spring break trip, being able to go watch the son play some sports during the spring. Now you have meetings, uh, personal workouts with your position groups almost every day. And, you know, some of those guys, they, they, weren't, they wasn't getting the quality of life that it was at one time. And then, like I say, you go to the summer, you had your summer camps, your satellite camps. Now it's let me keep my guys around. You got to deal with summer school workouts. And it it just became a burden, I think, to some of the older guys on the collegiate level that you see maybe leaving then on the professional level with the, some of the money that the guys are making. And if, if you don't have a good quarterback, the NFL has become a struggle league. You can't just run the ball because of the speed on the defenses now. So it's a it's a whole lot of, you know, change. And it, I think it's going to open up some doors for some new blood. Uh, you know, I, I heard somebody saying that Coach Flores, who's with the Minnesota Vikings now, 
you know, he's going to be up for a job. Raheem Morris is uh, in the mix for a job once again. So it's quite a few guys that's going to get another opportunity at being a head coach. Right, right. And when you look at the dynamics on the collegiate level, uh, not only with all that you just mentioned, the fact that the transfer portal is opening up during bowl games, and it seems like they're going to have to do some reconfiguration and push that portal opening back because you got guys opting out, uh, trying to preserve themselves for the next program that they'll be suited up for. So it's a tangled web that we see things right now. And it makes one wonder. I know the pay is good, and but the stress levels are so high. Is it really worth going into coaching? Well, and, and that's the thing. I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit. You, you mentioned about the transfer portal, where at one time, so as an NCAA coach, they gave us, uh, in the summertime, really a recruiting calendar for the fall, upcoming year. So it told you what dates you could go out on the road recruiting, what dates were dead periods, what date was a contact period where you could go on campus. And, you know, they had all these different rules. Well, those rules – were actually set by the quote unquote big boys and they changed it to fit the bowl schedule where coaches could go out at a certain time, but because certain schools were playing bowl games, they made it to where everybody had to come off the road. Or where you could go to schools and you can you could meet with the coaches but you couldn't talk to the kids. Well what's the purpose of going to a school to see a, a quote unquote kid or a PSA a prospective student athlete and not be able to see him in person. So but that that whole calendar now has gotten out of their hands. So now it's a little bit harder for them to control. So like I say, they're gonna probably try to tweak it a little bit to make it more event advantageous to the power four as it will be known by now. So they're gonna set the recruiting calendar calendar that everybody else will have to follow. So it may be a push back to you won't have that signing or that transfer portal period. It may not start until January, but now with the playoffs, the playoffs are going to be as late as the Super Bowl. You know, football is becoming a two-semester sport now. So it, it's going to be rough uh, on on the coaches and the student athletes in terms of when can you leave. And, and they may make it to where you have to stay through the spring semester almost like it used to be in order to transfer and go to your next school. So now you can get a little bit more in academically. But the problem that you're going to have is if you are if you know you're leaving the school early, will you still be able – you won't be able to use the facilities to work out. If you're an injured player, you won't be able to uh, train or rehab. You know, all those – there's a whole lot that goes into it that people don't think or know about. Right, and with all, all that being mentioned – um, we don't see it on the surface right now, but with all these rules being rearranged, how does it affect those who remain on the FCS and in particular HBCU level? Well, I think the thing is just sort of a trickle-down effect. How, how are you going to get the guys, the, either the bounce-back guys, or, or how are you going to get the guys that's just unhappy where they are? Or you may have a chance to just say a guy comes to your place does well for a year or two, then somebody takes a chance on them, and then they go up and don't get the playing time that they thought they were going to get or things don't work out, they don't like the environment, uh, and then you get them back. So it, it, it's a whole lot of how you're going to manage your roster with what what's coming down the pipe. So I think, like I said, you're going to have to wait and see what the quote-unquote big boys do, and then from there – you will know how to either adjust your roster, uh, how to go about recruiting out of the portal, uh, what kids do you take. And, you know, it used to be you mainly only got kids that either got in trouble, maybe got injured, or just didn't like the fit. Now it's it's become a money thing where you almost have to offer a kid something just to get him on your campus or before they come on a visit. Like I've heard stories from some big schools that kids are charging schools just to visit them, and schools are paying it. Uh. And that's not going to happen at an HBCU, for, i say for the most part. You know, you may have some schools that can give a kid a little bit of something, 
but not to the scale that some of these other schools are giving kids. Right. Well, you know, one thing I, I kind of reported on last week is that um, we're struggling well enough with the cost of attendance issues on our level, where that yes. has been open way before NIL ever came to be. And my counter is somewhat that if we can try to find a formula that would work across the board with just the cost of attendance, and then maybe you have to spread out an NIL deal with some partners with maybe uh, offensive, defensive, and special team guy in the case of football, uh, where everybody's not going to get an NIL deal. But if you can get it across the gamut where the cost of attendance and with the research that I was able to do, Power 4, it used to be Power 5, they were offering where between 2 and 4 thousand dollars per student and when you look at that number alone coach that would wipe out our budgets almost overnight you know trying to accommodate that uh, if we're going to try to talk about all student athletes on a 350 to 400 in a lower school status like that of HBCUs that we, we already crying and we're kind of in a crossroads aren't we yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is trying to see how can either the business side of campus, the alumni side, or the business partners within a certain radius of the university, how can they help out as well as, you know, just the, the kids doing some things for themselves. So uh, at, at one time what some schools were doing, when they when they were calculating cost of living, you know, it's a it's a formula that you basically get from the financial aid office that tells you what's the cost of living for an in-state and an out-of-state student. The other thing is what some schools were doing, and like I say, sometimes our people can be so gullible. What they were doing, you know, a kid may get a Pell Grant check. So what some schools were doing, they would take their Pell Grant check and divide it just say if a kid was going to get $2,000 for that Pell Grant, they would divide it up into four, quote, unquote, installments and pay the kid that money and and made it seem like they, the, you know, such and such school is giving me X amount of dollars. Another thing that some schools would do was just say if I'm at Prairie View, I would tell all my players to – go find either the lowest cost in apartment or some guys actually qualify for Section 8 housing while they're in school. And then what you can do is they can apply for that Section 8 housing and you give them their housing from their scholarship um, in a payment plan. You understand what I'm saying? So just say mm -hmm. what some schools would do, they would find the three highest costing dorms on campus and they came up with this is how much it costs to stay in those dorms per month. And they would give those kids a check that may have been $300 a month, but if they were on Section 8 housing, it may have been only costing them $60 to stay in their apartment or wherever they were staying. And, you know, you get a couple of them to live together. You know, so it's some things like that that people were doing. Or they would find an alumni with some apartment building and say, hey, can we – can, can I send you 10 guys to live at your apartment and they pay $300 and it's sort of guaranteed money for a different institution. So it's a whole lot of things that people can do to make it to where it seems like they're putting money into their players' hands. The other thing you had to think about, though, is those guys eating. So just say if I was at, if I was the head coach at Prairie View or Grambling, I may say, okay, you can live off campus after your second year of school with a certain GPA, but you have to keep your meal plan. And that would guarantee that, you know, guys still going to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, they they going to have enough money because they either off-campus apartment that you know where they live in or they in Section 8 housing. So now they still have some money in their pocket, some discretionary income, as we would say. So it's, it's a couple things. Like I say, you have to be creative in order to try to figure out some of these problems. But you also have to make sure that you keep your team intact and not all over the place. And you have to have some mature guys to, if you get them money for their rent, it has to be paid, as well as making sure that they're conducting themselves accordingly when they 
have on uh, off campus housing. So it's a, it's a couple of things that I think that we can do as HBCUs. We just have to be creative and use our inroads and our alumni to the best of our abilities. Well, let me state this first. You might need to put together a course, man. I, that that might be a, a number one selling course on teaching how to wrangle that together. And the second point is, wouldn't that create a bit of a higher risk of losing a grip on your program with guys not quote unquote supervised? Well, like I said, if you think about it, Prairie View has apartments. They don't, to me, they don't have dorms on campus. They have apartment style living. Whereas a place like Southern and Grambling, they still have more dorm style where you go in through a lobby, you pass by someone, and you go down the hallway with several different rooms where as a prayer view, you have more outside access. Uh, some other schools that I've been to, uh, the Alabama A&Ms may have more apartment style living. So you, you're dealing with that, but that's why one thing you can throw in there is that grade point average part. Or you can throw in the two years, no incidences with judicial affairs, no failed drug tests, no, uh, you know, no issues with your girlfriend, which I'll put your hands on each other, you know, different. You can put some things in there. So now it's incentive based instead of just age or classification based. And guys, like I say, you tell a kid that ahead of time, they're going to strive to try to make sure they have a 2.5 grade average so they can live off campus. They're going to make sure they stay out of trouble so they can live off campus. And that's just a part of the maturity process. But at okay. the end of the day, the coaches still have the discretion to yay or nay it. Okay. Um, man, it, like you said, there are a great wealth of opportunities of being creative. Um, but it seems like some people are going to have to actually earn their income instead of just resting on this is how we used to do it because with the way things are moving uh as they say you got to poop or get off the pot and uh we're definitely to that point right now which leads me to the situation that we are experiencing from texas southern uh one week is this the next week is that uh, can you make sense of what is going on? I kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, put it out that maybe uh, Texas Southern was waiting on Nick Saban to come and, and resurrect the Texas Southern program. But seriously, wh what do you make of what's going on right now, Coach? Man, you know, it is it's a shame, and that's the only way you can put it. It is incompetence at its highest. And the bad thing about it, in my opinion, and like I said, Texas Southern really could be a gold mine from an athletic standpoint because of, number one, you can get guys in school, and number two, because of the majors that they have, it's, it's hard to flunk out of school, there, in my opinion, because, you know, they have, you know, the, the general studies program or liberal arts, you know, some of those programs that you see guys go into, and you may think to yourself, what are they going to do with that degree when they get out of school? But the NCAA doesn't care about what are they graduating in. They just want them to graduate in something. So you have a great opportunity. You have a great amount of kids that you can pull from. But the more you keep doing negative things, the more people are not going to want to send their kids there. When I say people, I'm talking about parents. And then the next thing you got to deal with is these coaches not wanting to send their kids there. They can send a kid anywhere else, they'll send them somewhere else if they can, but you have to get that straightened out. That, and like I say, that's that's from me having worked there. Uh, that's from me being a swag guy that loves every school in the conference. But it's just they going to have to do something to get that figured out. And some people are going to need to get gone because, in my opinion, they don't have the best intentions of the university in their heart, and people are being either they being selfish or they just incompetent. Yeah, it, it's still mind-boggling to me on how you need a unanimous decision uh, when you're voting one way or the other. It's usually majority rule, but uh, maybe there's something we're missing on that. Meanwhile, in Tallahassee, um, there's a little 
uh, I guess, just uproar about potential candidates uh, wanting to take over in that role. How do you see that position? I don't see it as convoluted as we have at Texas Southern, but it still creates somewhat of a challenge. Now, it seems like they're trying to flip against the current AD. Yeah, I, and I think he may have rubbed some people wrong previously, so uh, that is part of what I think is going on. The other thing is the players came in, and I think I want to say they sort of lobbied for the defensive back coach over the defensive coordinator, and they had an outstanding uh, defense. So I don't think you can go wrong with either one of those guys. But I, like I say, me be, having been a defensive coordinator, I would find it funny if they promoted somebody that was working under me. But it has worked before. You think Dabo Sweeney was not the offensive coordinator when he became the head coach at Clemson, but it worked out for him, you know, you could say in the long run. So sometimes having that guy that the players believe in may make them play a little bit harder for that guy. So it's it's just a, a whole lot. But I, I think when you don't seem to have a succession plan in place, it's not a good look. So had had I been the athletic director at FAM, knowing how good Coach Simmons had been doing, I would have had me a list already, and I probably would have talked to some – I would have talk, definitely talked to some of the student athletes, just like, hey, you know, who's your favorite coach on the staff? Not, and not necessarily favorite, who do you think is the best coach on the staff? Uh, because the favorite and the best is not always the same. And I would just talk to guys in a casual conversation. So now you can see, okay, what do I have in-house? And then I'm going to have my short list of either alums or people that may be in the area that I can get from, that may be coaching at another college close by, that may be a defensive backs coach at Florida State or somebody, a running backs coach, at, you know, somebody that's somewhere else that I can pull into my program. But you have to always keep a short list of, of who you want to try. And actually, I was looking through some notebooks that I had the other day. Of, I had a list of, when I was the head coach at Prairie View, I had three people at every position that I would call if I lost the guy. And then uh, after last football season, I, you know, I talked to some people at, you know, a couple of different universities and some high school. And I, I started back making me, okay, if I get a college job, these are the people that I'm going to call at this spot. If I get a high school job, these are the people that I know I can get to. You know, if I'm going to Cypress, I'm calling these guys. If I'm going to HISD, I'm calling these guys. So you have to, as an administrator, have a backup plan already in place. Okay. Now, with that being said, usually in the case of a fam, you, you've already had the secret sauce for success. Uh, you got everything going in. Wouldn't it make sense to get someone who's already embedded in the cu culture of what you have than to pull someone from outside? That that makes a lot of sense unless it's a no-brainer. You know, just say somebody that comes from the outside that you may not even know was interested in your program. But like nine times out, <laughs> nine, yeah. So nine times out of ten, I would say if you have a success, stay in house unless it's a no-brainer that even the guys that's on the staff will say, "I right, I can see why they hired this guy." Uh huh. Because you do have some animosity. It might not create it on the surface, but those duck moving underwater, moving feverishly. Some guys can get into their feelings when they feel like they weren't given a fair shot, at least to be discussed about the potential of being the next man in charge. And then they have to be subordinate to whomever they choose to be. And sometimes that can create a problem too, though, right? But the thing is, Mike, you don't have to be subordinate. You can get you another job. That's the way I look at it. Uh -huh. So I, I I give you a perfect example of my own life. So me, both my brother and I were both working for Coach Doug Williams at Grambling. So Coach Williams let my brother go at the end of the season, and I was about to get married. That had a lot to do with it. So I was like, I cannot be about to get married with, and be unemployed with that short turnaround time of trying to find a job. The other thing uh, was he left. And they brought in a guy that I sort of had some feelings a funny way for, but I took that opportunity to learn from that guy. 
And a lot of what I learned made me the quote-unquote defensive coordinator that I became down the line. I could have walked in there with, man, I'm a better coach than this guy, but I took that opportunity to learn. So, you know, you you can do different things. You can make the best of any situation that you're in if you get where I'm coming from. So other than that, I could have left and said, nah, I can't work for this guy, and I have left the job because at the end of the day, Mike, I work with a guy that made me sick to my stomach. But mm. it was one of those situations where I had to suck it up for a while. But when I found a break to get out of that place, I got out of there, you know, yesterday. So you can make a decision <laughs> not to be there. But uh, if you're going to stay at a place, you have to do what's best for those kids. It's not about you if you're working at a place a lot of times. It's, it's about those kids that you're coaching and the other guys that, that you're working with. We're talking with Coach Heist Northern, our football expert here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. Uh, Coach, I have a, a running somewhat of a joke, and I'll ask you this question now, sir. Who will make the announcement of their new head football coach first? Will it be Texas Southern or will it be Alabama? Man, Alabama going to have a coach by tomorrow morning. <laughs> Hey, I don't, I don't know where you like to eat in Wilder County, but I bet you a Wilder County baked potato, Alabama going to have a coat. What's the date? Thursday, Friday uh-huh. morning, Alabama going to be walking somebody through the door. <laughs> you know what? Just because you put in the baked potato, I might have to take you up on that, Coach. I all might right. have to take you up on that. That's all right. Well, Coach, look, before we get out of here, man, uh, it is the beginning of Wild Card Weekend. And uh, I'm, I'm interested to see who you got advancing after week one. Well, I'm gonna put it like I ain't gonna say I'm gonna put it like this, but I, I really believe that I'll tell you who I'm pulling for. I'm, I'm definitely pulling for the Texans. Hold on, real quick. I'm trying to find the exact schedule. I think, you know. I could call him out for you. (laughs) I got it. At the end of the day, I think it's going to be Baltimore, and I don't know who in the finals, but I think the Texans are going to win. I think Kansas City is going to mile away uh, Miami in that cold weather. The the Pittsburgh-Buffalo game, I think Buffalo is going to win that one late. Uh, Dallas going to buy the wild Green Bay. And then that Detroit Rams game, I think that's the one that's going to be a toss-up. But I think I'm going to have to go with Detroit since they playing at home. Okay. And what about and the last the, game? The, I'm, pulling, uh-huh. I'm, pulling for, I'm pulling for the Buccaneers since I used to work with Coach Bowles. Okay. And Philadelphia, okay. Philadelphia is struggling right now, man. They, they can't beat Wild High right now. Uh oh, <laughs> that's saying something. Uh, being my brother, he is the only Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan that I know. When they came to life in 1976, he's been a Buccaneers fan from their inception. He would love to hear that you're pulling for the Bucks this weekend, so I'll be sure to relay that message to him. Coach, we're getting to wrap this segment up. You got any closing thoughts and comments for us this week, sir? Man, you know what? With all these coaching, uh, sort of, you know, the legends retiring, it brings me back to some of the legends that I have been able to come in contact with, uh, with the likes of Eddie Robinson. I'm gonna tell you a, a, a quick story about Coach Robinson. I had some uncles that played for Coach Robinson in the '80s. So my uncles are from a small town called Grove State, Louisiana. If you know anything, if you're driving across that swamp bridge, they used to have a Tigers at this truck stop. So when Eddie Robinson came to town to recruit those guys, like everybody knew that Eddie Robinson was coming. And, man, it was like a parade when Coach Rob came to Grove State, Louisiana. And it, it's, it's three big events they say it happened in that small town. Number one, my uncles, they had the first brick house that was built in that town. Number two was when Eddie Robinson came to visit my Uncle Wayne and his brother 
uh, to come play football at Grambling. Like I say, people were lying the streets, and Coach Rob could barely get in the house because everybody wanted to shake his hand. And the third thing was when they built the Tiger truck stop in that small town. But, you know, like I say, Coach Rob was a legend. Like I say, I used to go to the SWAC tour and hear him. I played for Marino Chasm as well, one of the greatest storytellers of all times. That guy could be the meanest guy in the world. But if that if you, if I call Coach Kaz and say, Coach, I'm up for a job, can you help me? Man, that dude would bend over backwards to try to help his players out when it came to life after football. And then I'm thinking about, you know, I was fortunate enough to play for Coach Richardson. So I've been around some of the legendary coaches in HBCU football. And like I say, we, we talk about it. I remember when I first got to Grambling and Coach Rob was still alive, he would sort of hold court. You know, we'd go sit out there at the baseball game, so it would be Coach Rob, uh, Doug Williams. You know, you might have a Shaq Harris. Don't talk about when Ernie Ladd will come to town. And they would sit out there at the baseball game, and, man, it was like watching – a deaf comedy jam of them guys just telling stories about, <laughs> like, re- remember the time. And, and and you could sit out there for three or four games in a row and never hear the same story. So I I have been truly blessed to be around some of the HBCU football legends, uh, you know, during my day. And, you know, some of those guys that have been lucky enough to get coached by Saban or Belichick or, or Coach Pete Carroll and the – I, I never met Belichick, but I had a chance to meet Coach Saban when he was coaching the LSU, and he was one of the most intense guys in the world. Now, he's a guy that I don't know if I could work for because he said some things to his coaches on the practice field that I don't know if I could have taken as a man. But he paid the <laughs> coach so well, I think that they took it. And Coach Pete Carroll, I met him when I was coaching at Prairie View. We went to play – at the play at the Coliseum where USC played, and he just so happened, and he came to the bus, and man, he talked to our guys like he had been knowing them their whole life. You know, it's just, you know, I, I've been blessed, man. The football has taken me from coast to coast, north to south, from Seattle to Florida, New York to California. So I, and, you know, some of the NFL stadiums. So I've been, I've been blessed to have met some of the legends and let football uh, take me all over these United States of America. Absolutely. In the words of Garrett Morrison, instead of baseball, football been very good to you. Yes, sir. It has been. Okay. Well, Coach, we appreciate you and your continued uh, uh, content that you bring to the table, man. Couldn't get it anywhere else, uh, any uh, other format possible. And we're truly thankful and indebted to you for that. And hopefully everything will work its way out. We say this every week now. It seems like for almost two months about this Texas Southern deal, but uh, it's got to be a breakthrough sooner or later, you know. And I don't know if they calling in Pete Carroll, uh, Belichick, or Saban uh, for interviews, but uh, hopefully something. You know, they had Hines Ward uh, being mentioned, and um, it would be all ironic when they end up we got Fred McNair, but that's for another day. Uh, yes, Coach, sir. thank you so much, sir. Lord, say the same in the creek don't rise. We'll get together as soon as we get something breaking on who that next coach will be at Texas Southern. I am the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. Thank you guys so much for joining in with us. Don't forget, you can follow me on X at the Mike Prince Show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. And one more thing before we get out of here, Coach, I believe Pittsburgh is going to find a way. <laughs> hey, you know, like you say, I'm I'm pulling for him, but that quarterback play, you know, Josh might put on his cape and pull some things out for the uh, bill. Yeah, we miss, we want to catch him by that cape and drag him down. So we'll make sure that everything is good. But we'll, I tell you what, we'll talk about all that next time around. Yes, Ladies sir. and gentlemen, my time has come where I must exit stage left. So until the next time, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.